Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. If you hear a lot of crashing and banging and popping in the background, that's fireworks going off. So um wanna start with a little bit of housekeeping. So on the channel, I just uh the a lot of the subs you can see is like fourteen thousand subs. I don't think subs are getting notifications. So if you can please help out with uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell notification. And then the other thing is if you felt like you were helped with crypto or whatever or want to donate to the channel, um, I've put some crypto addresses that you can donate Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Pirate Chain, Wow Narrow, and Mo Narrow. If you want to um, donate, just Click the address and donate whatever you want. If you don't know how, that's really what I want to encourage you to do. So if you don't know how, figure out how. Go get one of those wallets and send me .000, I don't care what it is, just send it to me um, just to get you so you're familiar with it. Um, so let's get to the silver chart. So we're running the, let's just go ahead and pull up both indicators at the same time. So right now we've got the KST up. Let's put up the MACD. If you remember the MACD was the one that was rolling up. And we did get that, you can see, we've got a little green volume crossover here. That's not volume, actually. Let me put volume on as well. But we've got the green crossover on well, about the normal volume. So we're, we, we have already crossed over the zero line, or we're just at it. We've got green. And you can see in the past when we got green, that's lines up with kind of where it takes off. Happened here, happened here. So like I said before, our bullish pattern is in place um, with the signals really working almost perfectly, not quite, almost perfectly from October at that price of 22. And from there, just kind of like a steady bull. So, uh, so we cut through some resistance. You can see this top blue line, or the middle blue line here up in the top is, uh, that's the downtrend line. And it's it's got some touch points. So we, we got right through that. And you can see we kind of, Popped through it, came back, and took off. Uh, but and that was right when we're converging uh, with that downtrend line with the 30. And you can see the 30 marked the same spot where we just broke right through. So very bullish. We haven't had a daily cross on the KST, but I would say. Two more days of green, we will cross on the KST, and we already have crossed um, both. We're at both the zero line, which is a signal, and at the low crossover. So it's a double signal on two indicators. So yeah, I think we're going higher. Next test is going to be around 32, maybe lower because this is falling down. So 3150 maybe is the next test. I'm not sure if we have a full trading day Friday, but we'll see what happens on Friday. So I want to spend the rest of the time on supply and demand. Specifically, this is not the last entry from Ted Butler. I am not a member. This is from the Free Archive. But I wanted to read No Let Up. There's one after that, which is actually the December 31st review. Oh, that's 2016. So 
2020th. You've got the weekly uh, 23. You've got the weekly review on December 30th. And then right before that is this article. So let's dig into this and listen to Ted. Um, one thing that I find real interesting is that um, I didn't look up his age, but we'll see by reading this that he was, as of the end of December of 2023, sharp as a tack. Um, no, no signs of brain fog or, uh, you know, just, just as great as he always was for all that time. But let's jump in here because we're going to try to look at supply and demand, free markets, and the laws of economics. And can they violate those or not? Are they sacrosanct or not? So this was December 27th, 2023. No let up. It seems to me that the forces at play in silver, both working for and against sharply higher prices, show no signs of letting up. However, common sense and logic dictate that such diametrically opposed forces point to an eventual end to the stalemate. But the only real question being when. Since these opposing forces have been in play for 40 years, they've taken on a life of their own, and the purpose of this review is a brief overview and summary. Let me start with the forces that have worked to suppress and manipulate the price of silver to be much lower than any objective analysis would suggest, both on an absolute basis and relative to just about any other commodity or asset, most specifically gold. The direct cause of silver's 40-year price suppression is collusive commercial, mostly banks, paper positioning on the COMEX the world's leading precious metals derivative exchange. Now I was looking at that, doing some research on contracts size in silver because they have the 5,000, the 1,000, I think they have a mini too. But um, I think it trades in Chicago in the COMEX, I think in New York in the NYMEX, London and uh, Hong Kong and I think that's it so you know as opposed to Bitcoin jump over and look at that real quick you know Bitcoin pretty much ever since it came out yeah even back to Mt. Gox days uh, early early Mt. Gox days when Bitcoin was like three to nine dollars or so when I first started watching it, but right now we're down around 58, 85. It can't decide whether it wants to go up or down. It's broken this low, so yeah, we might get a drop. We might get a drop all the way down here to support at 48. Um, so that's what's going on with BTC. But it trades 24 seven. I mean, you can put the one minute chart of BTC up and sit here and watch it and just watch it day and night, 24-7, 365, and it'll just sit here and trade. And um, so that's not the way it is with silver. It's positively strange the way it is. You have a you have a comics close, you have a London close, you have a Hong Kong, I mean, it's open in different places and different places to take delivery. Isn't it kind of strange that in these modern times where we're actually talking about things like AI, you have just these few names. I mean, you could argue it's just the British Empire because it is Hong Kong, but that's China. So, but yeah, London, Chicago, Hong Kong, maybe some others, I don't know, Singapore, Dubai. I, I didn't dig that deeply. But, uh, so let's get back to Ted. So pervasive is the influence of silver pricing on the COMEX that it has become the sole price setter for silver throughout the world. That's what I was just talking about. The sole price setter for silver throughout the world. 
Now, there are suggestions that the world silver price setting mechanism may be shifting, say, to China. So I would agree the moment of the moment the control of the comics changes in any meaningful way, the decades old price suppression will have ended, although I don't personally suspect it will be due to China. The key to the control and suppression of silver prices on the comics by the collusive commercials has been the willingness of their principal counterparties, the managed money traders, to be led into and out from futures contract positions by contrived and rigged price signals. So while there have been significant and quite sharp silver price rallies from time to time over the scope of 40 years, the collusive comics commercials have mostly prevailed with the end result being that the price of silver is near universally considered to be extremely undervalued. Now, Ted has said for the longest time, uh, I, I used to be way into his stuff and I used to follow, he'd give the, he'd give like weekly numbers on how many the commercials are doing. And I don't remember there are hedgers and then all different categories of people trading silver contracts on the comics. But, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Uh, it'll come back to me. Uh, the collusive comics commercials have mostly prevailed with the end result being that the price of silver is near universally considered to be extremely undervalued. So, yeah, I remember what I was going to say. Uh, so, I mean, what's going on here? It, it's, I think it's something more like a wash sale. You know, wash sales are illegal in the stock market. Way back in the day when it was uh, John D. Rockefeller and all these other manipulators, Daniel Drew and Reed Jesse Livermore to um, to research it. But they had they, 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 they used wash sales. So wash sales were a way of just running up the volume on a particular stock and buying and selling basically to yourself. So, you know, if you if I mean if you think about it just in theory why couldn't you just have, if, if everybody's in on it and no one's cracking down, why couldn't you just have these guys that are basically the same entity? One's taking the loss, one's uh, making the gain. And uh, so I don't know about that. I, I mean, I don't, I used to believe the reporting, but I don't even know about the reporting anymore. Who's on each side? I can't tell you. But there's huge washing of, of volume and price. Um, so, yeah. But the collusive comics commercials have not succeeded in dominating and controlling silver prices in a vacuum for 40 years, as they have enjoyed critically important assistance by none other than those whose main function is to ensure markets such as comics silver futures are free from practices and manipulation clearly evident to have occurred. Sad as it is to say, not only has the primary federal regulator, the commodity CFTC, look the other way and sanction the decades-old comic silver price manipulation, but over time, the sanctioning has come to include the DOJ, the Treasury, among other government agencies, all which require an oath of office to uphold the law by key officials. Plus, there is the designed industry self-regulator, the CME Group, which also has been highly negligent and complicit in not ending the blatant comic silver price manipulation, but at least no one ever took an oath to uphold the law. At least no one there. So he's saying that, yeah, he's discussed it with the comics as well, but they're not government employees, whereas these uh, other officials are government employees. I still maintain that those supposed to enforce and uphold the law and have failed to do so for decades can't do so now because that would bring great shame on all these organizations, government and otherwise, for failing to have done so previously. That plus the fact that the principal agents of the comic silver manipulation over time, like J.P. Morgan, just happen to have been systemically important financial institutions generate, generally treated with kid gloves by the regulators. All these supposed regulators are just responsible, are just as responsible and guilty as a primary force in not letting up on the continued price suppression of silver, all along with the collusive comic commercials. Admittedly, the forces intent on keeping a firm cap on silver prices are not only powerful, but show no sign of letting up. And if there were any other possible explanation for why silver prices have remained so depressed for decades, I'm sure those explanations 
would be apparent by now. Instead, I've noticed there is a near universal agreement that silver prices are too low, with more than ever pointing to an artificial price control emanating from the COMEX. As powerful as this growing consensus should prove to be, there are other remarkably strong forces clashing against the forces of continued silver price suppression, which also feature every sign of not letting up. The strongest force pointing to sharply higher silver prices just happens to be the strongest primal force in economics, the law of supply and demand. So this is, this is going to be central to the argument, to your beliefs, to your positions, you know, where you stand on history, where you stand on the power of government, where you stand on different systems, free markets, capitalism, all of these terms that are thrown around. I don't like the term capitalism. Um, it implies something different than free markets. I like the term free markets because it's pretty clear you know, what it is. It means people trading things for value and money or currency freely without government interference. So free markets are essential for healthy economies, but that doesn't mean that they won't try to impinge on them. And that's when they tangle with the law of supply and demand. So is the law of supply and demand a law similar to other scientific laws? Um, there are laws of economics I think some of the most agreed upon laws of economics are that uh, artificial wages, a uh, high minimum wage causes unemployment. I think you could say everyone agrees on that. Um, not as many agree, and probably not Donald Trump agree, but I think a lot of economists, free market economists agree. Um, say in the Mises School and... Uh, Hayek and others like that, that uh, free trade is uh, a law. The freer trade, the wealthier the world, and the, uh, the trading partners as well. I think you can prove that by history. You can go all the way back to Tyre or go back to ancient uh, Phoenicia. They were rich through trade. Um, so is this a law? I think it is. Well, how can they interfere with the law? Well, let's continue. The law of supply and demand dictates that whenever the current supply of any commodity is insufficient in meeting current demand, then it is only a matter of time before the depletion of existing inventories required to meet the shortfall between current supply and demand is complete. At the point of true inventory depletion, then the law of supply and demand dictates that prices must rise sufficiently to increase supply and decrease demand to the point of inventory replenishment. So this is pure free market economics. As a lot of free market, laissez-faire, meat bon Mises, uh, one term they use, for example, is the cure for high prices is high prices. And what that means is the higher prices go, the more people have an incentive to look for what they're trying to find, whether it's silver, gold, coal, it doesn't matter. The higher prices go, the bigger incentive people have to produce it. And uh, all of the all the demand factors, the less, the less people demand it, and try to substitute something else, all these laws um, come into play. And so the issue here is how does government affect those? Or maybe not government, but quasi-government, or could be cartels or something like illegal drugs where there's interference, outside interference in a free market. It doesn't, there's no moral judgment, whether it's the government outlawing drugs or human trafficking, um, which is good, you know, that the government does that, but 
the market factors, you can analyze, for example, illegal drug trade by the market. You know, prices determine movement of criminal organizations, etc. So I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But supply and demand apply there in illegal markets as well. So when he says at the point of true inventory depletion, okay, depletion is going to be, well, this is where it gets really sticky. So we've seen plenty of instances where the average Joe at the coin store or the average Joe ordering online from Atmax or SD Bullion, we've seen cases where you couldn't get silver at the, the price that it was being advertised at. Sometimes it was reflected in um, high premiums, but uh, sometimes not. So what is the point of depletion? What is the point of true inventory depletion? That would be the last deliverable ounce on an exchange. I guess since there's multiple exchanges, it would have to happen simultaneously via arbitrage. But in theory, if the forces that are trying to deplete it or control it uh, are powerful enough, then yeah, for the law to kick in, you got to go down to the last ounce. And where is that? And then I guess if you, as he'll continue on here and show that the the more you suppress it down to depletion, the uh, closer you are to complete depletion, the more uh, explosive the move has to be for this law to um, bring things back into balance. Then the law of supply and demand dictates that prices must rise sufficiently to increase supply and decrease demand to the point of inventory replenishment. Since there can be no question that the law of supply and demand in silver cannot possibly let up until prices rise sufficiently, sharply, once the ongoing inventory depletion is complete, the only wild card is when silver inventories reach the maximum level of depletion. Not coincidentally, this issue has been of prime interest to me, as all readers should be aware. Now, this is where I'm going to have to disagree a little bit, because there are ways to prevent a maximum level of depletion of inventories. And as I pointed out before, one way to do that is to have a crash and a depression and just crash everything. Everybody's broke. No one has any money. You kind of see it right now in the physical market, not the solar. But imagine if the economy's just cratered across the board around the world where, you know, depressions worldwide and nobody's installing anything solar and nobody's building or buying anything solar and everybody's broke and doesn't have any money to buy silver, all of a sudden, you know, is 800 million ounces a year a lot? That that could um, that could replenish supplies. So we've we've seen it before when silver gets overpriced. I mean, 1979 is the best example. We had 20% interest rates. They fought it with 20% interest rates, and they did break it. So. That's a possibility. That's why I don't agree uh, with the what is implied here is that maximum level of depletion is inevitable um, without looking at you know what they do in the economy. Uh, you know, Nvidia chips, electronics, solar, all that stuff. In a, in a depression, that stuff could uh, the demand could go way down, and there could be plenty of silver. In silver, there are two kinds of bullion inventory, recorded and unrecorded. Together, I believe the two categories total around 2 billion ounces in total world inventories. Currently worth less than $50 billion as compared to more than $6 trillion in gold bullion inventories. So uh, I'll link this and let you finish this yourself. Very interesting. I really appreciate uh, his estate or whoever is in charge keeping this website up and his legacy because his legacy is important. Some very important men never never saw their legacy fulfilled in their lifetime. So we may be close, but just keep this in mind. $50 billion, that's his estimate of the 2 billion ounces. It's deliverable 
times the current price. Now it was 25 bucks at the time. So now it's 60 billion at 30. That's how much the value of deliverable silver is, as opposed to deliverable gold, six trillion. So people love to talk about the gold silver ratio. What's the deliverable ratio? So 50 billion times 10 is 500 billion times 10 again is 5 trillion. So it's above a hundred fold. So this deliverable ratio is actually uh, higher than the gold silver price ratio. Recorded silver bullion inventories amount to 1.3 billion ounces or 65% of the 2 billion ounces in total inventories and are in the form of all the silver ETFs, investment vehicles, plus the holdings in the commas. Now, does anybody really believe when we reach inventory depletion, the point that he's always talking about, maximum level of depletion, does anybody really believe that there's going to be any silver in the silver ETF, there's going to be any silver in any investment vehicles, uh, maybe not seized, even if it's there, it's seized, uh, plus the holdings of the COMEX, but they're all going to be zero, I would assume, when we reach that maximum depletion. Unrecorded silver bullion inventory, 700 million ounces, are held by those outside the recorded inventories. So I guess he's saying these are stackers, uh, stackers at 700 million. Uh, I guess that's what it's saying. But yeah, I'll let you finish it yourself, uh, taking too long as it is. So, as I said before, like, share, subscribe. Um, just jumping back to silver real quick. The big view. And there's a lot of other charts to cover, but I don't have time. And look at this. Are we actually trading right now? Yeah, we're trading. So, looks like we're getting a dump. Uh, dump back to the two lines we broke through. So yeah, uh, looks like we're going to get a test of both of those lines. See if we get a test down here. Uh, are we turning from an overbought? Not really. Not really overbought. Um, yeah, we'll see how far this corrects. I expect back to this downtrend line and no up because we broke, but well, your guess is as good as mine. We'll see, and I'll talk to you next time.